from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Jeff Whitworth reports on possible insect troubles in newly planted winter wheat and cover crops, namely armyworm and cutworm activity. He'll discuss whether these pests are causing enough damage for you producers to respond with an insecticide treatment. Also today from the Farm Service Agency, Scott Wilbrandt will talk about crop acreage reporting requirements that you producers need to keep in mind to preserve your eligibility for farm program payments. Later, Sarah Moyer talks with K-State's Doravar Ruiz Diaz about the K-State Agronomy Field Day coming up November the 3rd, featuring the latest on cover crop research there. And with this week's Stop, Look and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. All that here on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. For those of you who have planted either winter wheat or a cover crop here in the fall, there are already insect issues to contend with, so says our guest. Jeff Whitworth is along once again, crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. Jeff, these we'll talk about today basically fall under the heading of army worms around Kansas, you say. Yes, Eric, you know, we've had army worm problems probably since April or May this year, and it's really kind of an unusual year. And I'm not really exactly sure the reasoning for that other than maybe the reduced tillage has allowed a little more volunteer wheat here and there or grasses or something. But we've had more calls about armyworms this year in 2017 probably than the last three or four years put together. I'm sure it has something to do with the weather and et cetera, but we have had a lot of them. So the armyworms started – actually uh, infesting and eating the pastures, the Bermuda grasses, back in um, April and May. And I I usually get a few calls about that because one of the concerns of the growers and the county extension agents and consultants is, are they going to reduce the stand? In the brome pastures, we've seen them really not reduce the stands, but they're just about as good as mowing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, It looks like in, in certain places, it looks like it has been cut for hay because they do a really good job of cutting uh, the brome especially. But I've never seen them reduce the stand. And this year is no no different. We, we, we went out probably on multiple calls early in the spring about where the army worms were actually feeding and they do a good job of feeding. But nice thing about they're easily killed. Normally the growers or the producers don't realize they're out there until the vegetation is pretty well uh, decimated. But they can be killed if they're detected early on. And then they transitioned over into some of the crops, and then corn and sorghum and some of the other crops in the middle of the summer once those crops get up. And now we're seeing them move over into the only green vegetation that's left, agriculturally speaking, for the most part, and that's some of the cover crops and the wheat that's being planted. So throughout south-central and north-central Kansas, uh, I've gotten several calls in the last two weeks about army worms and fall army worms feeding on wheat or triticale or some of the cover crops, whichever, whatever the cover crop is that the growers are trying to or at least thinking about using for um, feeding the cattle, you know, as, as a grazing uh, substance this year. And they're really causing havoc with that. Let's focus then on the cover crops and where these worms are present. They are obviously clipping foliage and uh, reducing the uh, forage value of that crop then. Yes, the uh, the army worm or the fall army worm, and, and there's not much of a difference other than uh, uh, if you look at the fall army worm, they have four little distinct, in my opinion, four little pretty distinct spots on the last segment. The fall army worm doesn't overwinter in Kansas, at least in years past, it doesn't overwinter in Kansas. Now, if it if if we start getting really mild winters, it might. But normally, the fall army worm, once we start getting uh, frosts or freezing temperatures, they head south. 
uh, and it kills the remainder uh, of the insects, so they won't be a problem after that. The army worm, they can overwinter in just about any stage, so they can uh, actually be a little bit of a problem prior to that. But they've built up all year long in pretty good populations. So right now, the populations that I saw in the last week or so were about two inches long, uh, which means they're fairly mature larvae. Uh, they're going to be pupating. And as they pupate, it's probably – they'll pupate in the soil, in the leaf litter or the residue in the soil or, you know, right under some clods or something, loose soil. Um, they'll pupate, and it's a brown pupa. It's really pretty distinctive, kind of easily found if you're out looking. And then they'll, they'll stay as a pupae probably for maybe 7 to 10 days at the normal fall temperatures where it's in the 60 to 70s during the day and in the 40s and 50s at night. And they'll come out as a, as a moth, and the moth will fly around and lay eggs. They'll lay eggs on the germinating, you know, whatever the cover crop is. The first thing you want to look for is generally you find the damage first. It's a little window painting on the leaf itself. Now, I was real proud last year in 2016 in the in the fall, a lot of growers were really finding that window painting really early. I could, I'd go out and look, and it was hard for me to find. So I was really proud of them. But once you start seeing that little window painting in the in the leaf, you can dig around in the soil and find the little larva. That's the best time to find them. If the growing conditions are are good, and if you have less than four or five larvae per square foot. You know, I probably wouldn't risk managing or treating it at that time. I'd probably wait and go back another week. The problem is as the larvae get bigger, their feeding increases, so they'll, they need more and more leaf tissue. So they can spend a couple of weeks actually feeding on leaf tissue, and they will increase in size, and they will therefore require more leaf tissue. The nice thing about it, they don't feed under the soil surface. They're just feeding on top of the soil surface, but still they can reduce stands of wheat pretty quickly or cover crops, whichever the case may be, especially if the growing conditions aren't very well for whatever crop it is. Now, the thing is, once they get up to an inch and a half to two inches, and I I hesitate to use size, but they, once they're pretty big old fat worms, that's what most guys say, <laughs> um, they're pretty well through. They probably this year, you know, they're just – getting ready to pupate, so it's probably going to be towards the end of the month when the moths come out and start laying eggs again, then it's all going to be up to the weather. If the weather stays warm like it did last year, if we have a fairly open, warm fall up into December, we could see another generation of fall army worms, another generation of army worms. You just don't know. It's just every year is a little bit different. But every year we have two or three or four generations of each, and it just depends on the weather is how long they go into the fall and cause a problem with the wheat. And if we get good growing conditions, it's not as much of a problem as it is if we don't have good growing conditions. Now, in addition, Jeff, to the fall armyworm and armyworm activity, there's yet another worm pest in the fray, you tell us. Yes, an army cutworm. And that's a little bit of a different story. They're they're really small right now. Mid-October is when the eggs are just hatching out. The worms are starting to feed. The problem with the army cutworm, they're going to be there all winter long. And they're going to feed anytime the temperature's over 45 degrees. So even if we get some freezing temperatures or some cold temperatures, the army worm and the fall army worm, which are, you know, all of concern right now, uh, they're probably going to go away, but not the army cutworm. They're just going to quit feeding or cease feeding for a while, they'll be down in the soil. But then again, as it warms up in November, December, January, February, they will continue to feed, get larger. So generally, you start finding the most damage from the army cutworm, you know, in April or May after the wheat has broken dormancy and started to grow again. But if you're seeing any of these three worms, army worm, fall army worm, army cutworm, what you need to do is get out and try and detect their presence early by looking for just a little window painting or just a little tiny shot holding in the leaves of the wheat. And as the wheat plants start to grow and, and the worms start to get larger, you'll start to see that. It'll be a little easier to detect 
because they eat more and more as they get bigger also. Making a sound economic decision on whether to treat, though, given in particular wheat and if you're shooting for grain as opposed to grazing your wheat, you're looking very hard at the bottom line here, uh, whether or not to pull the trigger on a treatment here in the next two or three weeks. Not an easy decision. Uh, it's really not. Uh, like I said, if you've got good growing conditions, the wheat can probably withstand it. If you're out there looking right now and the worms are pretty big, inch and a half to two inches, I probably wouldn't treat because they're going to quit feeding in the next, what, not more than seven days if they're that big. So if you treat now, they've done most of the damage. I, I would just let it go and hope you get some cooler weather or wait and see what happens and then get out and scout when they're early. The key is early detection when the worms are small, when they're just starting to do the um, the window painting on the leaves. But really the uh, treatment threshold is oh, four or five per uh, square foot if the growing conditions aren't great. You know, if they're great, get out. And if it doesn't look like they're damaging the stand too much, even though you have quite a few worms, you may want to hold off a week or two and just see what the weather's going to be. And once again, in the case of cover crops, in that that's not a grain crop per se, you may even more so want to think twice about treating. Well, yes. One of the things we've seen about cover crops in the, in the last couple of years is this is a place for some of these worms to congregate or aggregate or be able to survive periods when there isn't any weed out. Uh, so it's kind of one of the unintended consequences, I guess, maybe uh, yeah, we would say of cover crops. So if you do have a cover crop and you are trying to get some up for grazing, uh, you may want to get out and watch that also because they can use that as a reservoir for moving out into the wheat as the wheat comes up, not just for the army worms, but for some of the other wheat pests also. Once again, we are seeing signs of fall army worms, army worms, and army cut worms in winter wheat in the places we've seen that crop get into the ground so far, as well as the various cover crops that producers have established here in the fall. Get out and look in your fields to detect the presence and make the according decision on whether or not it's worthwhile for you to treat against these worms. Jeff, thanks for the update. We'll catch up with you again soon. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you, Eric. That from crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, Jeff Whitworth. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We'll have more shortly on the K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network and over our way from the state office of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas is a compliance program specialist with the state FSA headquarters, Scott Wilbrandt. And we're going to talk a bit about acreage reporting and compliance provisions associated with our farm programs for 2018 now as we look ahead. We're in the midst of what is the fourth and actually final year of the 2014 Farm Bill, Scott. So with respect to acreage reporting... Some of those for the 18 program year are coming up at least one fairly soon. Right. Uh, producers need to be aware of uh, those with the perennial forage crops, uh, the alfalfas and the grass primarily for Kansas, uh, need to be getting into the office by November 15th and reporting those acreage. A lot of people associate our acreage reports with, you know, the annual crops, uh, but with the implementation of the livestock program, uh, we need those reports for grass because that will affect eligibility. So, again, November the 15th for perennial forages, including pasture land, which might associate with that pasture insurance availability to you as well. But then there is the deadline for reporting acreage on the new winter wheat crop. Yep, that's uh, December 15th. It's a big date for us. It's been moved up from prior programs, same as the last year, but that's December 15th. 
producers are encouraged to call in once they have the wheat in the ground. Uh, don't come in before that. Have it in the ground. Get your That way we have your correct report of acreage. Uh, I would highly encourage producers to uh, make an appointment with the county office because it, uh, it is a, a stressful period of trying to get those producers in by that deadline. Uh, a lot of times they're out in the fields, uh, and it's just a, a busy time of year. What are the consequences if that acreage is not reported as required in the timely fashion, if you will? Yeah. Well, the primary one is is your lack of eligibility for farm program benefits, being the ARC CO or the PLC. Uh, if you do not report all cropland acreage throughout the normal reporting period, you would not be eligible for that. So uh, obviously if you've got these fall planted crops, uh, you need to get those in. And then any additional acreage throughout the year, you have to have reported by those deadlines. But primarily for for us, it's the uh, the farm program benefits at this time. Noting, though, and alluding to, again, that livestock forage program, uh, acreage reporting does extend far beyond planted acres, right? Yes. So do not forget that requirement as well. How does late filing work if, in fact, a producer finds themselves on the other side of that deadline? Yeah, there, we have provisions. It's called late file. It will require an administrative fee. Uh, the basic fee uh, is $46. Uh, it's it's considered an administrative fee, and it could be higher than that depending on how much acreage you have and how long it takes us to uh, to go out and, and uh, document those acres. So... Uh, we do have those provisions, but the sooner you get in, uh, the better, because if things change or conditions change out there, although you can come in and request a late file, does not mean that we can meet those needs. So, you know, you can find yourself not eligible, even though we have late file provisions. And the acreage still needs to be verified, correct? Yes, yeah. F- field visits required. And you note that there is a new provision that was added this past year regarding late filing. What's that about? Well, in the, in the past, it was it was basically just silent. You could come in and request late file. It, it was just open, you know, essentially any time you want. But we've we've now put in there that we will not even go to the field if it's any later than the next year's acreage reporting date. So it's not an open-ended opportunity, here's what you're saying. It probably never was, but it was just (laughs) silent. (laughs) When we visited last time, we got into a trio of new provisions for this year, 2017, how cover crops, continuous CRP certification, and continuous perennial forage certification are handled. You might bring us up to speed on those three items. Yeah, those those were all new initiatives designed to simplify or uh, save some time. Uh, The cover crop initiative, all three of them, I've not really got uh, any calls from the field. So, you know, I take it they they are going well. The cover crops, basically that just changed how you reported or what you're reporting to four basic types, uh, which before... It could have been about anything, and then we we used an intended use. When you look at our uh, other provisions, our continuous perennial forage, that allows a producer. It's designed specifically for the the grass livestock producer. If their acreage is not subject to change from year to year, they report that one pasture they have, and then that just continues to roll over, and the only time they have to come back is if, if there is a change to the operation. And then on CRP, again, it's a one-time report for the life of the contract. That eliminates that producer. For example, if you're a whole farm CRP, you enroll and certify one time at the beginning of the contract, and that's the last you would have to come in. Uh, All of those have seemed to work very well. The only caution is, is for producers, you cannot change anything out there (laughs) without coming back in. And And I think that's where... We're probably going to see the end of all of it is when payments start to come out. Did somebody change and they did not tell us about it? All right. Just some uh, finer points. The cover crop types you mentioned four were established, those categories. You might refresh us on those once again. Okay. The four types are legumes, uh, brassica, and other broadleaves, and then mixtures, and then cereal and other grass. So, Obviously, your your cereals would be your uh, and other grass would be your wheat, barley's, 
and, and grass mixtures. Uh, they just put that in one category. The legumes would be your clover, vetch, peas, uh, lentils. That would just be one category. Your brassica and other broadleaves, examples of that might be radishes, turnips, canola, mustard, uh, sunflowers, these combinations. And then if you are if you have any other crops that don't match any of the previous three, it's just a mixture. Right. Most producers, you know, are pretty consistent about what they're out there doing, and we we kind of see it across in regions on what's actually being done. You know, if one county's doing legumes, probably everybody's doing them because there's an initiative that's been introduced and they're they're trying those. So that's been fairly manageable and mm-hmm. fairly yeah, we've, straightforward we've got along for producers. Pretty good with it. Yeah. You mentioned the ACRSI to use the acronym Uniform uh, Acreage Reporting. Uniform and, Acreage Reporting. And maybe some uh, issues with that you might explain. Yeah, the the accuracy it's it's a, it's short for a common reporting system between uh, FSA and your your crop insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, the intent of that is to start testing or introducing ways to be able to report at one agency and it be utilized by both. But the requirement or a fallacy of it, some producers have misunderstood, you are still required to go to both your crop insurance agent and report and FSA. We're just transferring the data back and forth still kind of trying to utilize what we can and what we can't. And so you have to go to both. That process, uh, it's just continually being adapted. And we're, you know, we're doing our best to to support it as an agency uh, to try and make it work. But, you know, there's still a lot of things that need to be done. The main thing is producers need to understand you got to go to both places. Uh, nothing's changed on that at this time. And uh, wait for more word on uh, this work in progress, basically, was yes. what that comes down to. And, Scott, you say one last thing to mention here. As far as continuous certification, uh, there was a, a bit of a glitch there. Oh, we've we've just had minor issues. Everything still functions accordingly. But producers just need to be aware that if they change anything, uh, they need to come let us know. Because, like I said, uh, what will happen is, you know, we will go through the reporting season. If you've done one of the continuous options, you know, our system is going to recognize everything is good until we go to make payments. And then if we find out an operator's change, there's been a reconstitution involved, that's a change. And all of a sudden you'll find that you had not certified timely. So uh, that, those are the things that I, I see you know, hopefully, you know, producers just, you know, stay focused on those. You know, if they change, let us know. Otherwise, everything should roll forward. A great deal of any of these questions or uncertainties can be handled fairly readily with a dialogue with their local FSA folk. And if there is some downtime here during the hustle and bustle of fall harvest, uh, wheat planting and so forth, that would be a good day to take advantage of that break and uh, get this all sorted out, right? It sure would. Do talk with your local FSA personnel about the acreage reporting and compliance provisions as they're in place today for remaining eligible for USDA farm program benefits. Scott, this update is appreciated. Thank you for coming over. Yep, thanks for having me. Joining us from the Farm Service Agency State Office for Kansas, Compliance Program Specialist with the FSA, Scott Wilbrandt our guest on this part of agriculture today. When we return after the break, Sarah Moyer will have the helm and she'll have the full details on the upcoming K-State Agronomy Field Day taking place a couple of weeks ahead. More on that shortly here on the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services.
Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer here to spotlight an agronomy field day covering cover crops. And it will be taking place November 3rd across the way to help tell us What to expect on the program, we have K-State Soil Fertility and Nutrient Management Specialist, Dorvar Ruiz-Diaz. Nice to have you on. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, And thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the Agronomy Field Day that's coming up in a few weeks here. I'm part of the committee coordinating this uh, event. And like you mentioned, we're going to talk about cover crops this year. We do have a lot of research going on, uh, specifically in Ashland Bottoms, which is one of the fields we have here in Manhattan. And the idea will be to cover uh, some of the main studies, some of the main uh, research that we have going on there, some of them long term already. Yes, one of them that's noted here on the program is 10 years of cover crops. Will you tell us more about that and the other research that's been done that will be covered at the field day? Yes, that's a, an excellent uh, topic that I think is going to be really interesting. Like you said, it's a study that's been there for more than 10 years already. And one of the aspects there, of course, key aspect in my opinion, is the long-term effect. You know, many of the things you don't really see it until after multiple years. And in this case, we start to see some very interesting results after multiple years of rotation. So that's one aspect of that particular study. But also the other component of this is a little bit kind of the intensification that's going on with this particular study where we have a rotation, a pretty intensive rotation, I will say, of uh, winter wheat, sorghum, and soybean. And again, Again, the idea is basically introducing also cover crop in that rotation that is a little bit intensive already. So there are some really interesting results, again, from the last 10 years that would be really good to discuss during that field day. Craig Rosenboom is the colleague working in that particular project, and he's going to discuss a little bit what he's seen over the years in that particular study. Not just the cover crops, but also tillage is a no-till study, and also that intensive rotation system that we have going on there. Other topics that we're going to cover that day, again, cover crops have really many potential benefits, and some of them are related to nutrients and water quality and so on. So Dr. Nathan Nelson is working in soil fertility and water quality. He has a really nice project there. It's actually a large-scale project looking at the value of the role, basically, of cover crops in terms of water runoff, water infiltration, and how much nutrients, actually, we are able to recover and maintain in the field with the use of cover crops. And ultimately, again, the effect of that in terms of soil health as well. So Dr. Nelson is going to talk a little bit about that particular project. Like I say, there are many interesting things to look at there. It's a large-scale project that has already a few years as well, but it's, the idea is to continue with that over time. The other aspect, we talk a little bit about soil health, and that's another topic that is a big interest for when it comes to cover crops. And Dr. Diane Presley, she's our soil management specialist. She's going to talk a little bit more about the soil quality. And when we talk about soil quality, we talk about mm-hmm. water infiltration, you know, compaction issues, and of course, uh, using cover crops, we have the opportunities to maybe deal with some of those potential issues in terms of soil quality in general. One other thing that, you know, a lot of our producers struggle with in recent years in particular is weed control. And we are seeing a lot of potential benefit from certain species, in particular in cover crops, for wheat suppression. And Dr. Anita Dili is going to talk a little bit about her project there. That's also something that has been going on for a couple of years, and I think there's some really interesting information to look at there. A few other things that we're going to cover that day, Dr. Ignacio Ciampiti and Dr. Doug Shoup are going to discuss mostly one particular crop and the effect of cover crops on that crop, and that's soybean. When we talk about cover crops, we intend to talk a lot about nitrogen and maybe corn and, and other crops. But what about soybeans? How maybe yields may be uh, affected with the use of cover crops? And that will be one of the topics we're going to be covering that morning And another topic that is uh, probably just equally important that we kind of touched a little bit already is the potential value for nutrients and specifically for nitrogen. And Dr. Peter Tomlinson is going to discuss the role of cover crops in that nitrogen cycle in the rotation and how maybe we're getting some additional nitrogen benefits, uh, availability of nitrogen for the following crops, and perhaps, you know, what kind of cover crops can provide that potential benefit. And, And just discuss a little bit that nitrogen cycle. 
cycle with the use of cover crops. Dr. Tomlinson also is looking at cover crops and the effect on other uh, aspects of nitrogen in terms of nitrogen loss potential and so on. So he also has some studies there that will be very interesting to look at for the nitrogen as a whole, not just for plant uptake, but also what's happening in terms of potential losses in the rotation with the use of cover crops. A wide array of conversations to be had around cover crops here at the upcoming Crops Field Day. Again, November 3rd is the date for that. You'll want to mark that on your calendar. And if folks are deciding to attend, what should they do for pre-registration? Yes, that's an excellent question. And we do have uh, actually a a website that is available now for registration. So that's one way to do it. We can do the registration via this website website. And the other option is basically just to call our uh, extension office at 785-532-5776. So either of those options are available for the website. Just going to the agronomy department website, actually, we have a link there right on top of the main page where you can click and basically register there. The field day is free of charge. Uh, The only thing is that you will need to pre-register so we have a account for the people that's going to be attending that day. Yes, a complimentary lunch included, and the field day will begin at 9 a.m. with registration. The sessions will start at 9.30, and it will wrap up just after lunch and some poster sessions around 1 p.m. So look forward to that. And again, as Dorivar mentioned, you will want to pre-register. Once again, to remind folks interested, where is this field day held at? Yes, it's in Ashland Bottoms, which is in the south part of town in Manhattan. We do have directions in the website and a map along there also. So that's very important to look at there and try to get exactly where we're going to be again in Ashland Bottoms, south part of Manhattan. The registration website, if you're having troubles through the agronomy website, you can look to agron-field-day-2017.eventbrite.com. Again, you can also contact the office with the phone number 785-532-5776. Thanks for coming on, Dorvar, and telling us more about this Cover Crops Field Day. Thank you, Sarah. That was K-State Soil Fertility and Nutrient Management Specialist Dorvar Ruiz Diaz. Once again, this Cover Crops Field Day will be highlighting water quality, weed control, soil quality, and more all surrounding cover crops and what producers can do to apply the advantages that are gained and some of the management considerations that go along with these crops. I'm Sarah Moyer and this is Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state. Kansas. Like you, I sometimes wonder about those early immigrants who radically pulled up stakes. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. A few days ago, a friend sent me an email from the Netherlands. I'll share it as it says who I am and why I have this program. Recently, he went on an afternoon bike ride before flying home to Maine, where they now live. Here's the email. One of those gorgeous mid-October days on the Hansrug. I thought of you enjoying a similar landscape in your home region. I will no longer have a home in the homeland but the old landscape with its oak trees, lakes, creeks, rivers, and old farms, windmills, and churches remain in our memory wherever we are. Like you, 
I sometimes wonder, too, about those early immigrants who radically pulled up stakes. They never returned, nor ever saw any image other than those already engraved in their mind's eye. When they sailed across the vast ocean, landed on distant shores, alone or with their young families, they trekked through alien forests, rode on wagons pulled by horses, mules, or oxen, and later steam engine locomotives. These men and women had to look forward, for if they did not, they might have become depressed. When wonders how many tears were shed and how many died of broken hearts, longing for the loved ones left behind in the old country. Not only people, but also ancient trees, meandering rivers, old cemeteries, ancient churches, familiar landmarks and landscapes shaped by ancestors in the course of centuries. I had to get off my bicycle and marvel at the soft sunlight striking the trees with leaves turning yellow. There, over a dozen pingos, small lakes, on the S and neighboring oak and beech forest, as well as some fence and small creeks running from the sandy ridges in the A and the Hunza rivers, meandering rivers draining northern Drenthe. As a young boy, I helped the father of a friend of mine with potato digging on that S. He was a farmer, the first one to buy a tractor, a red Messy Ferguson, and also the first to buy milking machines for his Frisian dairy cattle. Now, tree farms have replaced the rye, barley, wheat, and potatoes, but also tall maize, corn, now just being cut. In our use, there were no farmers planting maize here. But now, almost all those farmers are either dead or too old to work. I thought of the American Indians in the Mexican highlands who first domesticated these plants for food and which are now rooted in this ancient soil where rye used to be the major food crop. And then I thought about the potatoes, as you know, very common in our youth, but no longer planted here on the land. That crop, too, came from across the Atlantic, first cultivated in the Indian highlands long before the Incas and brought to Europe by the Spaniards. Long before local farmers in my village grew potatoes, they had grown cereals, especially rye, which was a staple food for the poor. Here on the land on the sandy back of the Hunza Ridge, slowly shaped and modified in the last two ice ages, and then since 5,000 years ago by early Neolithic farmers who invaded the hunting and fishing territories of the Mesolithic tribes, people. They found huge granite boulders scattered on the sandy ridges between fast-flowing rivers. These early farmers and herders had no idea that these boulders, too, were strangers in our land, as they originated in Norway's mountains. Nor, of course, could they imagine, as we can now, the huge ice cap and fast glaciers that had delivered these monsters. Originally, these granite boulder structures were covered with thick layers of sand and sod. In the course of time, Winds eroded the sand, and now they stand naked in the landscape. The fact that so many survived in Drenthe, the province, is perhaps because the farmers there lacked the money for the dynamite to blow them up. But it's also possible that they were left alone because they were associated with folk tales about ancient giants and mysterious powers better not to be messed with. The land has been farmland for about 5,000 years now. Today I see it divided up by fences, but in my youth, the individually owned lots were only marked off by stones and sometimes a wood stick. The precise dividing line was known to the neighboring farmers, and not an inch could be nibbled off. 
But what the farmers removed with every harvest, carting away the rye and other crops every fall, they also returned in the form of cartloads of manure of cows and pigs. And so it is that the earth and the skies here in our homelands have shaped us in a way difficult to imagine by your children and their children, my children, who grew up in the Flint Hills of Kansas. But they too may feel rooted. After all, the human imagination is a vast space ready to be filled with ideas and associated feelings. And that is, I know, what you try to do every week with your stories. Stop, look, listen, and think. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. With that, this Wednesday edition comes to a close. Thanks for tuning in. And for Sarah Moyer, Eric Atkinson here, this has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.